Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast. Steve Palazzolo here with Sam Monson, and we are going to recap cut day, Sam. Cut day, trade day. It all went down this weekend, as always. It did. Can I just... So, we all... Uh, the day after the regular season has a name, right? It's Black Monday. And that's because six or so really rich coaches up to their eyeballs and guaranteed money are going to get fired. Do you want to... 1,500 people got fired over the weekend, all of whom, most of whom had no guaranteed money, and that doesn't get any kind of name. It's just, that's ah, cut day. Bye-bye. Yeah. I think like we should flip that. Back to UPS right. type of thing. Like Monday morning after the regular season should just be, you know, I don't know, coaching firing day. It doesn't deserve a black Monday. This is, this is the black day in NFL calendar, Steve. 1,500 people just got axed. I know. It's and then, rough. You know, your best hope is to maybe steal some IR money. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to get stashed on IR, get some guaranteed money. That's or, what, so that's what people don't understand. I understood this from my baseball days, right? Yeah. If, Dollar. If, that's, a, that's a buck. <laughs> but in, back in baseball, it was the same thing. In the NFL, is the same thing. You know, if, you kinda, if you're going to get cut and you get that nice injury, everybody's like, oh, man, this poor guy. It's like, what do you mean? You just I was going to get cut. I'm going right. to make some guaranteed money here. I'm yeah. going to make. I don't think. I don't know if it's their full salary if they're on IR, but it might be half or two thirds of what you know minimum wage salary would be. It's way better than getting cut if oh, you're yeah. going like, to get cut. I mean, it, particularly with young players, there's that whole you know the IR injury. Uh, like that's why a lot of them do settlements, which is yeah. Like less. this guy's. We don't really want to cut this guy, but at the moment, given how he's playing, we kind of have to. So instead. How about we say you have an ankle injury? It's yeah. you know you're, it's niggling. It's going to last a while. We'll put you on IR. Well, those are important. We don't have moves. to cut you. You can stay around, and develop. Everybody wins. First off, I think NFL rosters should be bigger. Of course. I mean, I think just some interesting things going on here. There are three teams who currently don't have a backup QB, right? So um, I think Seahawks, Colts, one other team in that mix. They just straight up cut all the quarterbacks because there's you know, enough backup quarterbacks on the market right now that they're going to start filling in the gaps there. Uh, I, also I, was, li- I also like to think they've read my, uh, the, my pinned tweet. What? Oh, yeah, yeah, the Tom Moore. The other thing, um, I was going to go the other way. Other way if I was GM, right? I was going to yeah, store. Yeah, you want like five of them. I want to keep the four or five quarterbacks because just in case you strike magic, the trouble with that is, is there actually value? So like a Kyle Sloter who dominates the preseason. He's not fooling anybody into, you know, throwing a third or fourth round pick his way. Right. But maybe at some point there is. If the quarterback... I mean, at I, the moment, given given the way that baseline of replaceable quarterbacks has gone over the past few years, I think I'd lean to the way the teams have at this point, which is... That's the thing. There's there's way more... Right. There's a ton of these guys. QBs We're around. pretty sure after training camp that the two and the three we already had are not one of them. Therefore, you know what, I'm just going to get rid of everybody. And if we lose Russell Wilson or whatever, we're already screwed. So what yeah. does it matter? All right. Do you want to hit on the uh, big stories? Or yeah. do you want to add a name for this day? Did you name it yet? No, I didn't name it. I mean, it, this is, I think you just insert black with whatever day it was. Saturday? Black Saturday? So it's Black Saturday. Everybody's getting cut. Or if black has already had too many names with Monday and Friday and whatever, we, we'll have to come no, up with a different still, color. There's no Saturday. There's no? So like charcoal Friday's Saturday? Friday's the day after Thanksgiving. Monday's the day after the regular season. Saturday's the two days after the What's a really dark pre-season? color that isn't black? Dark brown. Dark brown. Very, very, very dark brown. Saturday? Yeah, dark gray. Yeah. Something like that. The color of your shirt. Yeah. There you go. Very, very, very dark brown. Saturday. It's also the first Saturday of college football, so you can't put a complete damper on it. Well, that's, I mean, that's just unfortunate timing. There's nothing <laughs> I can do about that. Unfortunate timing. It was a fun Saturday of college football. Check out the YouTube channel. We'll have some videos breaking it down. All right. Mm-hmm. Big stories here. Let's start with just, just the Houston Texans in general. The first move that they made, Jadavian Clowney, their franchised edge defender, being traded to the Seattle Seahawks for very little. Yeah. So... Is it possible... Third round pick, Barkevius Mingo. Is it possible that you have actually become the general manager of the Houston Texans on the quiet and just haven't told anybody? Neither have they, because that's the only way I can think of that anybody would actually value Barkevius Mingo as part of a trade. I do love Mingo. You do? I do. And this I can't is, think of any other reason you would want him thrown into a deal. This is different from me calling a breakout season for Jameis every year. Uh-huh. 
because there's oh some, no, this is like the irrational data, one. Right. right? There's some data behind James. Yeah, yeah. This is Mingo. just a guy you loved coming out that you refused to see the bad of. Yeah. ever. This was before we had PFF data, so yeah. it's not like I was like, man, this guy was a 95 PFF, you know, college player. He's gonna. This was just eyeball test. You know what this is? Did a couple things. I loved Mingo. You know what this one's actually like, except probably without the 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 happy ending, if you like. I saw like Jason Babin play one amazing game in his rookie season and spent like the next decade waiting for him to break out. And it finally came right at the end. 18 sack season right, or whatever. Right at the end where they moved him out to this wide nine thing. And we saw that guy again. But I spent like the better part of a decade being like, it's, it's coming. It's got to be. I've seen it. We need some wide nine. Right. This Mingo. is like you with Mingo, only it hasn't, that part hasn't happened yet. So explosive at LSU. <laughs> so you're trying. You think I snuck in there and traded for? Yeah, yeah, Clowney yeah. Flamingo. That's the only way I can think of that it makes any sense. As I said to you off air, I mean, all it was was an exchange of former top six picks. I like the way Clowney you phrase and, that. Uh, this is how you Mingo. get that GM job, right? You have managed to spin this in a way that looks good for the Texans. What they have done is they've exchanged former top six picks. They've got the guy with more experience. That's, there you go. And I'll tell the media. And for less money. And positional versatility. He's a linebacker. He's an edge. And they got an extra defender in with the bargain. And a pick. This was a no-brainer. This is a huge win for Houston. I didn't make the move, though. This wasn't me. It wasn't you. Someone after my own heart made the move. Okay. Um, somebody tweeted yesterday that the Houston Texans job is becoming less attractive. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now that they don't have a By top the move? Pick. Yeah. Um, they don't have a top pick until 2022. But so the, the kind way of looking at it is an exchange of former top picks... They get the Texans get an extra draft pick and uh, another player. What's the reality? The unkind way of looking at it is they just traded away a very good edge defender for two not very good edge defenders and a third round pick. Yeah, like Mingo would have been cut, and if he wouldn't have been cut this week, he would have been cut every single week for like the rest of the season. Like he was a perpetual roster bubble guy. Like at no point. He didn't go from being, you know, someone that no one really wanted but kept finding his way onto rosters to an integral part of a defense in a preseason. No, he didn't. No. So, like, I mean, he is essentially a throwaway element of this trade. And and the other thing about it is the Seahawks are going to get the third back if they can't re-sign Clowney. Right. And what's the word? You guys say it differently. I don't want to say it the way oh, normal people say. Yeah, there you go. So that that's the bigger issue right here, right? When you let a free agent walk of clowny stature, you're you're essentially going to get that third round compensatory pick. Yeah. How do you say it? Compensatory. What? We don't really say it. Like it's not a it's, it's not a word that comes up in. Good move. Just don't say it. So they're going to get uh they're going to get a comp pick. Yes, there you go. Um, a third round pick. So essentially, you know, the Texans. You know, the Seattle's really making out here. The other thing, they really if you look are. at this from a macro level, Seattle's going from Frank Clark last year, who you mentioned, we mentioned on the pod last last time, is a guy who, if you just put on the highlight tape, is fantastic, much like Jadavian Clowney. Yes. And while Clowney might be slightly overhyped for where he really is in the league, he still finished number seven among edge defenders last year. Frank Clark finished 21st <laughs> in a very good season for Frank Clark. Clark had more sacks but as we know sacks don't predict future sacks and all that fun stuff because Clark also uh you know rushed the passer quite a bit now Clowney rushed the passer quite a bit last year too played over 900 snaps in the regular season but he is an elite run defender he is uh similar to me to JPP in his prime and I'm actually going to fire up what uh our friend Kev Cole uh, from the analytics team I'll, I'll, I'll fire over some co- some comparisons that he sent me okay um in a minute here but this uh, this is where i think seattle at a macro view is improving over frank clark who they traded earlier this offseason i think so um i mean the only for seattle they have apps this is an absolute robbery of a trade they have won this in a huge way the only determining the only question mark is in which way are they winning it are they winning it by essentially renting clowny for a year uh, getting the third round pick back and all it cost them was Mingo who they would have cut anyway and Jacob Martin who has looked not great so yeah. far in his NFL short NFL career so that's one way they win it the other way is they end up tying down Jadevian Clowney long term and he becomes an upgrade over Frank Clark and all it cost them was those two guys right. and a third round pick so 
either way, they've won this trade in a huge manner. The only question is, which particular avenue are they going to take in order to win it? Here are some clowny comparisons. I've been comparing him to JPP in his prime. He is on this list, but more prominent on the list. Um, just to put in perspective, he's not. he has not played like Khalil Mack. He has not played like um, Von Miller, you know, even though Von Miller's on this comparison list, but a little bit further down. And I want to give credit to Mike Mayock. Because remember, right around draft time, it was Jadavian Clowney, the universal consensus number one overall pick. And mm -hmm. I think right at the end, Mayock said he'd take Khalil Mack over him. Okay. Which everybody he did love Khalil Mack. Which everybody laughed at a little bit. I know, now that he doesn't right. get, to, get to have him. So Olivier Vernon in 2017. Now, this is based off of war. And as we talk about uh, war or wins above replacement, how much are these guys worth over a replacement player? The best edge defenders are maybe up near a win. And then, you know, the very good ones are between a half win and maybe three quarters of a win at best. So Olivier Verne in 2017, where he was almost a half win and then went down just a little bit in 2018. Justin Tuck, 2009. Remember, a good versatile defender who could play on the edge, play, you know, kind of Michael Bennett before Michael Bennett became a popular mm -hmm. movable chess piece. Demarcus Ware. 2009, just before he started to decline a touch. Muhammad Wilkerson in 2016, before he decided, before he declined a little bit. Terrell Suggs, that's another, Terrell Suggs is another really good comparison, because if you talk about Suggs in his prime, he's just a hammer against the run, one of the best on the edge, and was always a guy who could have 10 or 12 sacks, but not because he was dominant, but because he's going to be out there every single snap, and he was a good, not great pass rusher. Then you see Vaughn Miller, 2015, Whitney Merciless, 2017, Lamar Woodley, 2011 so some some comparable players here who other than Von Miller there's no I'd say Von Miller and DeMarcus Ware are yeah. the two superstars on this list right and then beyond that it's a bunch of guys who are very very good and I think that's what what they're getting with Jadavian Clowney good yeah player. I mean we we summed this up a couple of weeks ago um the, the the top 20 plays of most edge rushers look the same like, if you pull up the top 20 plays of any of these guys, they're going to look like... They're all going to look like Khalil Mack. Um, and then the, the, basically the difference between them is how deep into that you can go before they start to look different. Right. So, you know, with Clowney, maybe the top 50 plays or so look the same as Khalil Mack and Von Miller. But it's, it's the next 50 that become the problem because the next 50, Khalil Mack and Von Miller are still going. They still all look the same. Clowney's, they don't. Um, and his thing has never been like the top end plays, his highlight reel, the stuff you can pull out if you're looking for it looks spectacular. It's the stuff in between that isn't as good. And the bottom line essentially is that he just doesn't make plays with the frequency that those other guys do, which is what keeps him away from being a great player or the player that justifies you know, the all-generation hype that was around him when he was coming out as a draft prospect. He so far has looked like he will always remain a good but not a great player. Let's just put it into perspective using pressures. So last year, Jadavian Clowney in the regular season had the third highest number of pass rushes. J.J. Watt was number one, his teammate. Then Miles Garrett, then Clowney with 581. So Clowney, uh, I'm sorry, Garrett had 18 more pass rushes than him. And he had eight more pressures. So 67 to 59 in total pressures. So just from a pressure standpoint, Garrett was more productive. Then you have a guy like uh, Cameron Jordan. He had one fewer pass rush, but he had seven more pressures. D. Ford had uh, 18 fewer pass rushes, but he had 19 more pressures. So there's a lot of guys getting after the quarterback. Melvin Ingram had more pressures on fewer attempts. Brandon Graham also did. Michael Bennett also did. Uh, Danelle Hunter from the Minnesota Vikings. Vaughn Miller, of course, who we mentioned before. So there's a lot of guys, even Yannick Ngakwe, on almost uh, on about 80 fewer pressure uh, few, fewer attempts had more pressure so that's the point I think with Clowney right is he is not getting pressure at this extremely high rate or and in, in a more dominant fashion than his peers um, so he had from a in, in the pass rush grade PFF pass rush grade takes that into account that's why he was number 15 in the NFL in the regular season last year can we talk about Jacob Martin the other element of this trade yeah if you want to lose all of our listeners i just sh i don't got to spend like 20 I'm minutes kidding, on i'm it. kidding just, just a, PFF know, a quick analysis we'll talk about everybody here so 
Two preseasons worth of action. He's also playing the regular season. Get to that a little bit later. Two preseasons worth of action. Can't wait. Amazingly consistent. <laughs> 63.3 overall in 2018. 63.6 overall in 2019. If you know what you're getting. You do. Um, had 11 total pressures this season, which is actually a decent number. Quite high um, up the list of overall pressure getters in the preseason. However, six of those came in one game, week one, against Denver's backup backups. Yeah, that's uh, right. So that's, that's not good. So that was basically his only good pass rushing grade of this preseason. 90 in that game, 50s in all the other games. Uh, and if you look at his regular season, he actually played mm, 225 total snaps last season. And his overall grade, Steve? 63? No, 66. Oh. So slightly better. I like it. But rooted deeply in the 60s. Actually had 25, 24 total pressures, but that's based on 175 pass rushing snaps. So essentially, that's a guy who has shown that, you know, he can at least pressure the quarterback, but it's going to take him quite a long time to do it and is probably not, you know, the upside doesn't look huge. Let's just say that. Yeah, I mean, they're not getting good players. No, no, they're not. In exchange they're for They're getting a guy who's young. They're getting Mingo, and they're getting young Mingo is essentially what we're talking about here. Oh, there's hope. And a third-round pick. There's hope. Uh, one other thing about Clowney. I saw somebody talk about his versatility in slowing down versatile running backs or something like that. Like, Jadavian Clowney's not going to Seattle to go play in coverage. No. He has 86 coverage snaps in his career. And this was a silly thing back when he was about to get drafted in 2014. Remember, the Texans were running an old-school 3-4, and they were like... We don't know if he could drop into coverage. Right, we don't know if, if he could matters. do it. It's like, come on. He's going to do that 15 times per year. He, last year was the most times that he dropped into coverage. It was 31 times. And yes, every now and again, you've got you've like, to rush and you've got to peel out with the running back. Like That's a play call. The only team I would say today for whom that's even a thing is the Steelers. And oh, even yeah. them, it's not a big deal. Right. It's, you know, go jump out, play curl flat. Right. And man, if you have Jadavian Clowney, just don't make him do it but all But at this often. point, you're talking about, like, we only need to even think about that for one team. And even right. then, we can get around it if it's a problem. So, you know, that's a handful of plays. Last year, 31 out of his 967 snaps, including the playoffs, were in coverage. So, just for some perspective, um, he's not going there to uh, play in coverage. And if he is then maybe Seattle didn't win the trade. So He's going there to rush the passer. The hashtag we kept using with uh, your, your GM campaign in Houston was hashtag how hard could it be? And, and special shout out to all of our listeners who keep firing that over at us. Right. They're making it look kind of hard. Maybe it's more difficult than we thought. Right. Yeah. Because there was another trade. Yes. Another trade by the Houston Texans. Larrabee Tunsil coming to Houston in exchange for every valuable pick that they have. <laughs> Between now and 2030. <laughs> this, is like, this is like the Ricky Williams trade, but over a few seasons. It's like, you know what? We've, yeah. we've come to the realization that all of our draft picks in one year isn't actually that valuable. So how about instead we give you all of the valuable picks, but over a few years? So the 2020, so that's next year's first rounder, 2021. So first rounders in 2020 and 2021, but also a 2000. 21 second rounder, I believe, right? Or is it 2020? There's a second rounder in there as well. Yeah. The point is two firsts and a second. They get a third and a fourth back. Uh, they also get Kenny Stills. Wow. From Houston. Who was clearly on the way out anyway after. That could uh, be an interesting guy on the field, though, if you have him, Will Fuller, and DeAndre Hopkins on the field at the same time yeah. to deal with. Anyway, um, here's how I summed it up. And I think this is, this is really important when you look at the Texans. Their first round picks starting in 2017. 2017 was Deshaun Watson. They mm -hmm. actually picked Good. him. Well done. 2018, they had no pick because of Deshaun Watson. Okay. So Watson was their pick essentially for Still Houston okay because he looks like a good quarterback. Yeah, good. that's okay. We're good so now far. Now to build around Deshaun Watson, yes. here's what's happened. 2019, offensive tackle Titus Howard, Ooh. who has struggled so far coming out of Alabama State. He's a bit of a projection. And then 2020 and 21 will go to Laramie Tunsil, who's not on a free, who's not on a rookie deal, who is... Not a top three or top five offensive tackle. Not Could even. he get there? Maybe. But last year, we're talking about a guy who's, you know, a top 15 left tackle, still pretty young. And last year was his first year with a PFF grade over 70. So solid, good, but not a top, you know, top tier offensive tackle, which again, I, some people were asking, do you need a top tackle? No. We'll talk about that in a and second. And it was only okay. just over 70, the grade. Yeah, he's like, 70. Yeah. yeah, he was a 70. The top guys, for example... David Bakhtiari, Teron Armstead, the guys that are legitimately 
you know, elite yeah. left tackles, 88 up towards 90. That's a big difference between those guys and Laramie Tunsil. So what you're starting to see here with the Texans, this is the danger. It's not so much the danger in trading up to go get a quarterback, right? You go up and get him, right? Go get the quarterback. He's well worth it. But then you have to make some good moves after that to build around him. We're starting to see the Texans, you know, they already don't have the best secondary in the world. Mm -hmm. They've spent so much draft capital trying to build this offensive line. After they traded Dwayne Brown, they just spent, we mentioned that first round pick on Titus Howard. They spent a second round pick on Max Sharping. The 2018 draft, they didn't have a first or second rounder because they traded Brock Os Osweiler and a second rounder, if yes, you remember. They did. Right? Was yes, it that they year? They did. Um, or maybe it was 2017. Either way, they, they have not been able to build that offensive line. They've spent so much resource um, around the offensive line with very little draft capital the last couple of years. Now they're trading two more first rounders and a second rounder. They just lost Jadavian Clowney. We mentioned he's a high-end player. So now you're seeing this team who has not replenished in the draft the way that you need to after kind of going all in on a quarterback. That's really risky from a roster building standpoint. That's why maybe the job's less attractive now in yeah. Houston. The ironic thing is that if you just basically said that over a five-year period from the first round they would end up with uh, Deshaun Watson and Laramie Tunsil and nothing else, that wouldn't be the worst strike rate in the world. Like Teams out there over a five-year period of first-round picks will do a lot worse than that than getting what should be a franchise quarterback and what should be a decent left tackle. But you're getting a, a left tackle that you have to pay, so it's not a rookie right. contract and guy. It's, it's also about the process, right? It's You probably didn't need to do that in order to get that same you level didn't of need to. human. That's another story. Um, but again, Laramie Tunsil's not... Trent Williams, he's not Jason Peters, he's not Tyron Smith. To Joe what Thomas. extent do you think that his hype is uh, not a product of, but lo very much influenced by being the only viable human being on an offensive line of disaster? I think it's less about that. I think it's it's a first round pedigree. That's a guy who big. has gotten better. You know, he went from five star recruit to you know potential top ten player. Right has the video come out, falls to 13, starts his career a little bit slow, but he started to round into form. He's only 24, right? So um, there's but, a lot to like. But in the Larry same Tunsil way, as a player. in the same way that if I put you in a room surrounded by jockeys, there's only one person everybody's seeing in that room. Yeah, but I don't, but I don't, think, I don't think the Texans are trading for me just because of that. Well, I mean, it depends what they're looking for. I don't you know, think if they're looking for height. Maybe, maybe that's what stands out. I mean, out if it them. was a bunch of GM candidates and the rest are jockeys, I'm winning. Sure. I'm yeah. That. So I'm just saying that I think th there's a real s looking that much better than everybody around you can't be a bad thing for how people perceive you. I'm sure it doesn't hurt. But in overall PFF grade terms, that 70 is not particularly good. Like if you look at some of the players that are higher than that, that the perception is completely different from. Nate Solder, right, was a 74 last year. We're basically saying Nate Solder. Not worth what the Giants just paid for him. Oh, it wasn't right. a good season by him. He had the biggest a disappointing left tackle, left tackle season. Riley Reef, who was seen at this point as like a disaster for the Minnesota Vikings, actually is around that same kind of level, 70, right? And Riley Reef's issue is that when it goes bad, it goes really bad. But overall, he's not that much worse than Laramie Tunsil. Now, okay, the ceilings are different. You know, Tunsil's in the ascension. Riley Reef is just Riley Reef. Um, but like these are the players that are in and around Laramie Tunsil's grade. Like the grade obviously isn't everything. There's more to it than that. There's assignments and how much they're asking to do and all that kind of stuff. But again, we are not talking about securing, you know, the best young left tackle in the NFL for a foreseeable future. The same way the Seahawks are not talking about having traded for Khalil Mack, even if Clowney can make the same kind of plays, just doesn't do it as often. Tunsil is the same deal. He can make plays that make him look like Trent Williams or Jason Peters at their at their prime. It just doesn't happen as often as those guys. So there were a lot of people asking about, um, okay, so this isn't a big deal because you got to secure your franchise left tackle and all this stuff. And we've explained this before, but there's new listeners and all that stuff. So let's explain the basic concept. We we subscribe to the theory that you need to creep back toward average. Yes. On the offense, which by the line. way is being created as a T-shirt. It will PFS be a T-shirt. Might even be up there right now. Now checked. this this is a big step toward the Texans creeping back toward average. It's also a very short-term and short-sighted step in that move. It's like, look, 
we've had a lot of things go wrong leading into the 2019 season, i.e. we've got Matt Khalil slated as our starting left tackle, right? So some, some missteps have happened. It's up. Along the way. Oh, creep back to an average. I like it. Mm-hmm. Looks good. I mean, it's life advice. It's not just offensive line advice. See, it's right there. It's life advice. It is. It is. So creep back to an average. The Texans have taken a step right now. But to give up, you know, getting Laramie Tunsil, it's a nice player. It's a massive upgrade over what they had last year. And Julianne Davenport, who also got yes. exchanged in the trade. Oh, my gosh. Those poor Dolphins. Yeah. Poor Ryan Fitzpatrick. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. they're going the other way. The yeah. word, they were our second to worst offensive line or worst in our rankings? I think they were worse, and they got worse. Wow. Okay, so the poor Dolphins. Yeah. So the Texans have made that move going forward that they're going to creep back to an average with Laramie Tunsil. But doing it with giving up multiple high-end draft picks is potentially franchise crippling. Yeah. I mean, that's the problem. And then as far as impact of the left tackle, his impact is no different than the right tackle in today's NFL because they have to, they have to block. I mean, the, who are they going to block? In that division alone, the right tackle for Houston has to block Calais Campbell, potentially Josh Allen, their new draft pick, so two, two guys with the Jags, uh, Justin Houston with the Colts, and then the Titans with Cameron Wake they just brought in here. <laughs> so the AFC South, South right tackles, or your Texans right tackle, has to face a slate of pass rushers just as difficult as what Laramie Tunsil needs to go up against. Now, does he make the line as a whole closer to average? Yes, that's helpful, and it's a huge upgrade over Julianne Davenport. Yes. But it's going to be really tough to maintain a good roster as Deshaun Watson heads into years four, five, and six. Very, very difficult. And you've done that for one player who yeah. eventually is going to get overpaid at left tackle. I think the bottom line is there are there's certainly one position, probably two or three, um, that you can make the argument it ends up worth throwing a lot of draft capital at to secure the right guy, right? It's obviously, quarterback is the one. Like, if you haven't been able to find a quarterback, finding the quarterback is worth throwing basically as much as you could throw at him to get. Can we discuss that in a minute, what the Dolphins should do going forward? Yes. Okay. Um, so there's getting the quarterback. Basically, anything you threw at it is worth finding a Deshaun Watson, right? I think you could make the argument that, you know, finding Darrell Rivas or finding Julio Jones, like the Julio Jones trade, I think is probably worth what they did to to make it happen. It was a lot to give up. It's probably worth it. Can we go back and discuss what happened there, though? Okay. Predictably, predictably, as I predicted, the Falcons, they drafted Julio Jones. They gave up a ton of draft capital Mm -hmm. to go get Julio Jones. What year was that now? 2009? 10? 10 sounds right. Let's find out. No, you no, keep I'm, talking. I'm losing my mind. Um, anyway, for Julio Jones, so the Falcons made the NFC Championship in 2012 and lost. And that was the point where that roster... Yeah, it was 11, I thought. It was 11. So, it was just, so in 11 and 12, the Falcon, in 12, the Falcons really competed, made the mm-hmm. NFC Championship, right? And they lose. And that, I remember, nobody was on Twitter back then, but back on Twitter, I was saying, this is the end of their little window. Because they lost so much draft capital to go get Julio Jones. So he was worth it. He helped them compete for a couple years. And then 13, 14, 15 was a disastrous rebuild. They didn't have the draft capital to build the roster around there. So while Julio Jones, the player, was worth it, the Falcons had to sacrifice so many other components of their team. And it took them about three years to rebuild the right. whole thing again. And he's still there. And it's, again, from a long term 10 year deal, like it's worth it. But there were sacrifices that had sure. to be made there. I think for quarterback, it's basically worth it regardless right for i think you can make the argument that for a top tier top top tier wide receiver and cornerback it's probably also still also still worth it on balance right it's it's not without sacrifice it's not without growing pains but it's worth doing to secure that guy or at the very minimum you can make that argument left tackle is no longer one of those positions it may have been 10 years ago it is not anymore i also wonder how much of that was just perception right anyway if for no other reason than as you said, the right tackle is as big of a problem. He's one of five guys. The Dolphins had the 32nd ranked offensive line in the NFL with Tunsil there. Now they don't like you know what I mean. Like even if oh, he yeah. was even if he was the best left tackle in the NFL, it wouldn't matter if the four guys alongside him were turnstile jockeys. As here's, we talked about. Here's the other point: our analytics team 
just put and Eric Eager just put a piece out within the last two weeks that said pressure rates are owned by the quarterback essentially and we've thought about this intuitively right we're like oh well the Andy Dalton gets rid of the ball in 2.2 seconds Tom Brady gets rid of the ball quickly Peyton Manning gets rid of the ball quickly they're not pressured as often clearly they've got something to do with it on the other end Russell Wilson Deshaun Watson Josh Allen these guys hold the ball longer Mm -hmm. Aaron Rodgers they get pressured at a higher rate so intuitively we figured that was the case but you know they they might account for half the pressures or whatever it is and half the sacks or a quarter of the sacks or a third of the a big chunk of the sacks are simply on the quarterback yeah sack rates are pretty stable right particularly with a guy like Watson so if they want to save Deshaun Watson they need Deshaun Watson to play a cleaner crisper go through your progressions type of game rather than dropping your eyes like you did a lot last year and he took he was assigned like 15 sacks out of his 67 last year that we said this was all on Deshaun Watson I mean honestly the Texans their entire line is bad right left to right almost in entirety they would have been better off taking those three valuable picks in the next few rounds and getting three separate players that are average so that's that would have a bigger impact than even even if Laramie Tunsil becomes the next Jason Peters Joe Thomas David whatever if he becomes the best left tackle in the NFL over the next few years I think they would still be better off getting three rank average players with the three picks the three big picks they traded for him because that would have a bigger impact on a garbage offensive line but the the problem is you're thinking from a long-term standpoint and that's what I'll do when I'm the Texans GM we'll get to think long term they're thinking from a short-term standpoint I think either way you'd be better doing that yeah but you can't how is that 2020 and 21 draft pick and help you here in 2019 you're saying what they should have done? I'm saying if you take, instead of sending three picks to Miami for one player. Yeah, but that doesn't help you right now. They're, they're, instead of sending three picks to Miami right now for one player right now, take each one of them and send them for three different players right now. Oh, oh those picks. Oh, I got you. I got you. Okay. Go so find three, three average offensive linemen in the saying. NFL that are on the block for the right money. I thought you were talking about using those and picks. And send those I, picks I to make three different trades. I hear you. And bring in three average guys who collectively would have a bigger impact in protecting Deshaun Watson's life than one good player at left angle. Now, that would be fascinating. That's my plan. That would would have been my solution. I'm not a candidate for the Houston Texans GM job. I'm just giving this out for free. Well, listen, you'll probably be in the building as one of my assistants. I'm I'm not coming to be your social media guy. I'm just not doing it. You've impressed me a lot in the last year. Maybe you've moved up. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So. Let's wrap, let's put a bow on the Texans right now. Yes. Um, are, here, let's start short term. Okay. Are they a better team in 2019? Losing Jadavian Clowney, adding Mingo, <laughs> and adding Laramie Tunsil. I honestly don't know if they are. So I think you said that their their offensive line is bad, but yeah. if you put Tunsil at left tackle, uh-huh. if you get some decent guard play out of one of the rookies, Max Sharping or yeah, Titus look, I Howard, can find a way of making any garbage line look good. If you say if these five different things change from their current if Julian state, Julian Davenport, right, if he just puts it all together. Our our in, our inside joke is last year somebody was trying to explain away the Texans' O line. Yeah. It was like if Julian Davenport improves, it's like there is zero sign that this is going to happen. Right. It's like if he and just becomes didn't. a decent left tackle, all the problems are solved. Well, sure, but he won't. So what are we talking about here? So I would say that the bigger problem is even if Titus Howard becomes a pretty good right tackle over the next couple of years, Max Sharping becomes a reasonable guard. Nick Martin at center has shown signs of life, and then you get Tunzel at left tackle. Uh-huh. Like I could see a, a way that that becomes an average offensive line. Right. But giving up essentially three. You you've have to do you've it. given up three just for those – just for three players there, Tunzel, Sharping, and Titus Howard – You've spent three first rounders and two second rounders to yeah, get those I mean, guys. Just, so even if they get there from an O line perspective, the rest of the pieces, it's going to be an issue. Yeah, I mean the line is bad. I don't, I don't see a clear path towards that line even creeping back toward average. Creeping back toward average for that offensive line would be a monumental achievement, particularly when you factor in the fact that they are going to get stressed more than most offensive lines because of Deshaun they Watson. They will, but if Tunsil cuts, ball. if he cuts the pressure rate in half, again, he it's will. only it's only one position, but if he cuts the pressure rate in half... He like, might cut the pressure rate coming from left tackle in half. He's not going to cut the pressure rate in half. That's I mean, but from left tackle, which gave up 67, because the tackles are still going to give up the most. I mean, that's going to yeah. cut the pressure rate maybe in, uh, you know... 30%, 25% <laughs> as a line. That's a, that's a big improvement 
Sure. But a lot of it's still going to come down to Watson. So short term, are the Texans better? I don't think losing Clowney and gaining Tunsil, I mean, it's pretty much a wash. Right. I think they've basically stayed the same, only packaged all of the draft away for the next couple of years in order to do that. That doesn't feel like a great win to me. Uh, Seattle. Actually, they didn't pack it all away. Made out in they the just moved deal. all the picks back to where they won't make any difference. And they no longer have any picks of consequence in the next two drafts, and they have a ton of picks that have no consequence in the third, fourth, and fifth round. Think about the money they're saving by not needing to attend the first round of the draft. Hmm. Like, do you remember a couple of years ago where it was like, okay, they badly need offensive line help, but they don't have a pick until the third round? Yeah, that's the next two years. Right. That's the next two years, only now instead of the off... Well, A, it'll be the offensive line again because it still sucks, and B, it's going to be the secondary as well. It's going to be, we desperately need an entire secondary, and we have no picks until day three. Well, plus, they just lost in order Clowney. to make this happen. J.J. Watt's not getting any younger. You have to right. c- continue to replenish. But we're going to be coming out of these drafts. I'm going to be like, the Texans boxed themselves into a corner and had to pick three day three cornerbacks in order to fix their secondary, all of whom are bad. Not a place you want to be. No. All right. And in order to do that, they didn't get any better in the one year that it might have made sense. So are we ready to discuss the Miami Dolphins? So hashtag how hard could it be? Apparently quite hard. I'll solve it. I'll fix that. Pro- I'll fix all their problems. As a team, though, we're a team. Now we're moving to Miami and writing them off? All right. Okay. Let's go to Miami. Sweet. We talked about all offseason. Tank. It, it felt like a tank job, right? It felt like what they, uh, the plan that they should, should be trying to execute here is really thinking long term. How, so here's the thing, right? I think it's starting to be hard to argue that this is some form of orchestrated tank. How long term are we talking? Are we tanking for Tua or are we tanking for Trevor? So I described a scenario yesterday that's not, I don't think is that crazy. Cleveland Browns fans, I didn't even realize this, but I guess, you know, within the deep, dark Cleveland Browns message boards, these suggestions have been put out there. Essentially draft a million quarterbacks, see what sticks. Okay. But well, it's not. That a, made sense when they had a list of jerseys 25 guys did, long but it's not a, it's not a crazy thought so the dolphins from a draft capital standpoint according to ian rapaport i just want to you know in case i miss one or two it's his fault i'm just reading <laughs> they have four first rounders four second rounders and two third rounders with a potential third round comp pick wow. coming in the next two drafts Dude, they should flip all of their 2020 first rounders for 2021 first and an extra pick and just have half that draft like, that's the two-year tank job, right? You tank for Trevor, you end up with the first overall pick because your team is garbage, and you've basically accumulated half of that draft to just go nuts. Whatever you want. This is like playing Madden. This is yes. what we used to do in Madden. Right. Hey, look, I've got four first-rounders, mm-hmm. like the 2000 Jets. i got four first-rounders, and I'm going to completely change my franchise. So honestly, this is it's slightly different in terms of mechanics, but this is kind of what the Browns did, right? Yeah. You clear out the entire dead weight of the roster. You end up with $150 million in cap space. You end up with all the picks in the world because you spent three years basically trading back and not pulling the trigger. You finally get the quarterback. Now there's this Baker Mayfield. And then once Baker played, it's like, uh-oh, we, we did it. We hit it. Sound the, uh, sound the bell. QB's done. Move forward. Now you throw all that resource at the same guy, right? The only difference is that the Dolphins would be so confident that Trevor Lawrence is that guy that you can essentially plan that a year or two out. So instead of... Well, the tricky part is you have to know. Like, so in the 2020 season, well, the Bengals could be worse or whoever. Another team could be worse. Right, if you're trying hard enough, you can, you can be the worst team in the NFL. Like, if you're designing this yeah. from a couple of years out. But the point is the Browns couldn't do it until they got Baker. If for no other reason than they've thought they had the guy 15 times before and it didn't turn out. So once they got Baker, it's like, yeah, he's the real deal. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But nobody saw Baker coming, right? The right. same way you're seeing Trevor Lawrence coming like three years out. It's like this guy is going to be – this guy is the answer. Well the, well, the point is to have the draft capital to pounce when a guy does. So like last year at this time, I'm not saying Dwayne Haskins is, is one of those guys, but we had no idea about Dwayne Haskins. We had no idea about Kyler Murray. We had no idea about any of these guys. Right emerging so what i said for a plan so let's back it up to draft time right their draft they draft christian wilkins in the first round you know decent solid pick good character guy and all that fun stuff their second rounder goes to josh rosen they trade to arizona for josh rosen which at the time i said this is this is perfect this is how i would play it you need a quarterback josh rosen is a first round caliber quarterback let's see what you have in josh rosen but that does not keep you 
from drafting in 2020 and then pushing Josh Rosen out again and all that stuff. So they they made a lot of moves during the draft to to get draft capital for 2020 and beyond. Now they're doing it again with Laramie Tunsil, which makes me think. I had to, I wrote this down yesterday. The strategy. Remember we talked about the if the league still thinks left tackle is that valuable, then you take advantage of what of perceived value, right? What they did is took advantage of perceived value and desperation. There will always be a few coaches or GMs on the hot seat who are desperate, and there'll always be somebody around the league who maybe thinks left tackle is more valuable than it should be or pass rush is more valuable than it should be. And if you can leverage all of that into building a more valuable team on your end, I think that's how you start to creep back toward winning. Um, so here's what I don't think is a crazy scenario. 2019, they traded for Josh Rosen. 2020, they're in position to draft a top quarterback, whether it's Tua whether it's Herbert, who, hmm, not great last night for Justin, whether it's Jordan Love from Utah State, whether it's other, somebody emerges, you draft a quarterback. And then in 2021, by the way, Trevor Lawrence looked even worse in his first game. He so looked bad. I haven't seen an awful lot of Trevor Lawrence, but so far everything I've seen has been bad. You saw one throw and then... Oh, we are talking about like half a dozen throws in his entire career. I'll but send my you point is, all of them have been bad. I'll send you a playlist. I need to find like, I need to find a stretch of good Trevor Lawrence play because otherwise I'm going to end up being like, we're gonna, I'm just going to spend my my life waiting for this guy to fail based off the, the ridic- based off the PJ uh, Williams playlist, which is you got all the bad up front. And now you're like, this is the worst player in the world. So 2019 Rosen, 2020 another quarterback, Tua, Herbert, Love, Elder. 2020 draft Trevor Lawrence it's not a crazy because you still have plenty of draft capital to get other positions and to build the rest of the team and say they do draft Tua in 2020 remember I I think the goal needs to be I've got a guy who is a perennial top eight to ten quarterback Mm -hmm. right and that's what we feel like a guy like Baker Mayfield is yeah a guy like Sam Darnold could be but we think the percentages are lower and he's more likely in the middle tier those other, you know, some other guys who have come out, like Dwayne Haskins, is probably a middle tier guy at best. Out of the last two drafts, we thought Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, the two guys who are potential top eight quarterbacks. If Arizona immediately finds out Kyler's not going to be that guy, like you might, you might just know right away, like you knew with Russell Wilson. Mm-hmm. If Kyler Murray's not that guy, Arizona's kind of in that same mix. Like, do you just look for the next guy and just keep them coming? Yeah, except their problem is if he's not that guy, everybody in the building gets fired because they just did the Josh Rosen thing. Well, let's stick with the Dolphins, right? If you can just take take the passion of, here's my quarterback, we're going to rally around him, take that out of it, and just treat it like a business, right? And you say, say you get the 15th best quarterback. I mean, if Dallas was doing this for a few years, they wouldn't be worrying about paying Dak. They might have another guy to just turn it over to on a, on a rookie deal, and, yeah. then they, and then they go. This would just, I, if this was legitimately an orchestrated two-year tank job, this could change the way the NFL works. Because, you know, basketball has done this in the past. They had to change the way the lottery functioned, et cetera, because of the way teams like legitimately orchestrated tank jobs for extended periods of time. Right. The NFL has never done it. It's always been we don't tank in the NFL. We like this could be the first real serious attempt where teams actually go, you know what? We're basically doing everything short of coming out in public and saying, yeah, we're mailing in the next two years. Sorry about that, season ticket holders. Well, and the reason why it's so important in basketball is because there's only five players on the right. court and one player has so much value. And in football, of course, the quarterback and I don't has know, that much value. I don't know if the strike rate, if this, I, I don't watch, I don't cover basketball enough to have any real idea what I'm talking about, but it feels to me from the outside that the strike rate on draft picks in the NBA is higher at least for the important stuff you kind of know that the really really good guys are going to be really really good right nobody's looking at lebron james coming out and going well what if he's not the player we, you know what i mean whereas with quarterbacks it's still every even if we love this guy there's still a pretty high degree of his propensity hey. to just tank and look terrible there's still perfect prospect peyton manning versus one year wonder ryan Leaf right. in a and hot tub yeah exactly you know, I, don't, I don't know which it. guy to take <laughs> um but and that's the thing is that even if this does end up even if this a is happening and b does end up being successful it still might not work unless you can guarantee a trevor lawrence like if the next the next you know the, some guy goes oh look this freshman looks amazing let's start the tank job and then, like, two years later, the guy's never got, like, Josh Rosen, right? Two years later, the guy never got any better. 
Oh yeah, that's oh oh it's risky. Like, what do we do now? We just spent risky. two years tanking for this position, and Rosen like, he's now the third best quarterback in this draft, and the two guys that overtook him aren't even particularly good. Now we just tanked for a defensive end. So <laughs> Josh Rosen, after his true freshman debut. It looked like an incredible prospect. Right. It, I think Josh Rosen's debut and Jameis Winston's debut, he was a redshirt freshman, two of the best I've seen from a freshman who just came in and it's like, that's an NFL quarterback. Mm-hmm. Now, Rosen was terrible the next week against like UNLV. Winston carried it through his entire season. But again, even that has not predicted top 10 success for Jameis Winston yeah. and certainly not for Josh Rosen. I mean, if that happens, you are in a situation where you essentially need to keep going until you find one. Like, you just need to keep kicking the can like instead of instead of kicking the uh the salary cap can down the road until it eventually blows up and sinks you in cap hell you just have to like keep punting the draft down the road until the guy at the top is the franchise quarterback you think it should be the problem with that is there is not a gm and or coaching staff in the planet that's going to last that long right that's the again I, i say all this from an ideal I know I've, so got, maybe, I've got a 10-year plan here. Right. Type maybe scenario. the way of looking at this is this is the one perfect storm opportunity for somebody to ac- actually execute this game plan. Well, like part- it's never going to happen again, but this is the time right. to execute a two-year tank job to secure Trevor Lawrence and completely turn your franchise around. And I think the Dolphins and maybe the Bengals were in good place to do it because they had poor rosters, you know, bottom end of the NFL quarterbacks compared to the rest of the NFL, and new regimes. Yeah. They have a new regime there. Right. Whereas a team like Arizona also fit the bill, but then they had the number one pick and they could take Kyler Murray, mm-hmm. right? So they could they could move on. So I don't think this is a crazy scenario for the Dolphins. So say Tua, I've compared him to Jimmy Garoppolo. Jimmy Garoppolo's at when he's healthy has been a fringe top ten type of quarterback. He's probably likely in that middle tier right now. You see what you got in Tua. If he is that middle-tier quarterback, you kind of hope that you can flip him when necessary. And even if you lose a little bit of draft capital, and then you draft Trevor Lawrence in 2021, and you hit, and you're good, all of those moves, Rose in for a second rounder, Tua in the first round, who maybe you flip for another second rounder, you, like you lose a little bit of value. It's all worth it to, go f- to make sure that you secure that one guy. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to convince Dolphins fans of this. You're still looking for a guy you're still looking since for the next Dan Marino. Right. You're, since 1999, you've been looking for a guy. I mean, Chad Pennington showed some life. God, poor Chad. In 2008. But I'm all for not even taking Tua. I'm all for just punting the draft picks down to 2021 20, and having the entirety of that first round to do with what you choose. So that's also what the Browns did, right? So yeah. the Browns maybe didn't even make the right moves. And the key, the key with that, though, is that you don't even, like, you kick all these things to 2021. You guarantee the number one overall pick. You're taking Trevor and you have half that first round. What if that draft is terrible? You don't need to spend them in that draft. You can spend the first round pick and trade for whoever the equivalent of OBJ is that year or whoever, you know, whoever Olivier Vernon is that year. You can use that draft capital to get established players. You can take those hits because you have a monstrous amount of cap space that you've built up. And you probably have to because you have to get guys at different points. You can't right. just have like you, need to sur- you can't just have an entire team of rookies. Right, you can't have everybody... Yeah. You know, needed to be re-upped at the same time and all that stuff. So all that stuff has to go into it. So you could actually make the case that the Browns didn't do it right. Because if they were if they were truly doing this find a QB move, maybe they would have drafted a Jared Goff or a Carson Wentz. They would have drafted a Deshaun Watson or a Patrick Mahomes or a Mitchell Trubisky. And then maybe they still would have had an opportunity to stumble into uh, Baker Mayfield. Or you just you, they built the team. We'll take Miles Garrett. We'll take these other good players. And then when we get the guy, we get the guy, and they did stumble into Baker Mayfield the year that he came out. I think their way ended up being essentially the optimal way of doing it. It just wasn't by design. Like, obviously, they fired the regime halfway through the, the grand strategy, but I think it ended up playing out as perfectly as you can do it. Well, that's the tricky part, because the fan base doesn't love it. It's because right. you still need to sell tickets every year, and it's that's tough to be thing. like, listen, guys. That's why even if the Dolphins are doing this, it's never going to be said in public. Like, you're never going to come out and say, look... right." Suck it up. We're gonna be, we're gonna be bad for the next two years, but don't Hashtag worry. There's suck this, it up. But don't worry. Dan Marino 2.0 is coming down the pike, so just just ba- brace yourself. The Rest other part, easy. The other part about these AFC East teams, they've been sitting there losing to Brady and the Patriots and you know Belichick for the last twenty years. Yeah. At some point, Brady's gonna move on, so they're almost orchestrating this right, for this a time. Yeah. When Tom Brady might be moving on in the next <laughs> couple of years, we don't know. Next we shall 15 see. Fifteen years. So. Um, I think the Dolphins are in 
fantastic position. Now, <laughs> what's that? They're, just, just, they're in a fantastic position to secure the number one overall pick for the next two years. Yes. They're in a fantastic position to be the worst team in the NFL for two years running. Let's discuss the other side of this, right? Can we just – hang on. Yeah. Well, their offensive line right now, there's not a human being on it that has a PFF grade higher than 55. There's two guys on it that don't have PFF grades at all because they basically barely played. Like, yeah. this th- – poor. Like if Ryan Fitzpatrick's going to go out there and get murdered within two weeks – Josh Rosen's going to get out there and have the same situation that he was looking at a year ago in Arizona, which is I, you're not going to be able to tell anything from this. So his career is done because he can, never got put in front of an offensive or behind an offensive line that could do anything. I, I just thought oh, it's, it's depressing. Really so is. in the short term, you have, you have guys like Dan Orlovsky taking the players point of view here and it's like poor Ryan Fitzpatrick you're, or poor Josh Rosen. That's exactly what, what you said, right? So I've heard other players say that and it's true also if you do look at the brown situation it was like well all the coaches got fired and we've talked to some of those coaches who were in that situation and they felt like they were guinea pigs essentially like we were a part of this tank plan and then we weren't part of the solution yeah and it and from a human element standpoint it's rough i mean it's not great i also think maybe the browns made those decisions in order to execute their plan there's certainly a degree to which in order to make this happen particularly a two-year thing like you you can't it, it can never come out publicly which means at some point something needs to happen in order to satisfy the bloodlust right yeah the fans are going to be losing their minds over you having the worst team in the nfl for two straight years at some point you need to throw something to the baying mob right and that something is going to be a poor position coach who's just along for the ride doing his best with the worst down situation in the nfl it's like sorry frank we, we need to throw something to the bang mob, otherwise they're going to storm the castle. But the NBA's the NBA has figured out to have patience with this, too. And it's like, here, just deal. You get that coach that's good with the young guys, and it's like, just stick with them. You know, you might only win one or two games, but this is the guy to, to lead us out of it, right? And you just, have to, you just have to earn that buy-in from the fans. So there's that perspective, and then there's the other idiot perspective <laughs> – <laughs> from the hypothetical executive that texted a- Adam Schefter, which was like, I remember a time when the Browns had a million picks and they blew them all. They, they drafted Johnny Football and Gilbert and all these terrible players, yeah. right? Which I responded to somebody yesterday. I said, that's like saying, it's really nice having Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, but they throw interceptions sometimes. Hmm. Like there's a, there's a good strategy to have. And just because it hasn't worked or guys haven't picked properly in the past doesn't make it a lesser strategy. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to have a good quarterback, even though every now and again you're going to lose a game with them or they're going to throw picks. Yeah, I mean, basically the the bottom line with all of this is that the, the dumbest people in the NFL are all 100% results oriented and don't have any concept of the process. Like they would do if like the fourth down people. If it didn't work, it was a bad call. OK, yeah. but it wasn't it, it, like it was the right call. It just didn't work. That happens because we're not dealing with zero sum situations here. You're dealing with the percentages. Right. You play the better percentage. It's like poker, right? If you play the percentages, you win long term. It doesn't make it a bad call because the card, the, the wrong card came out. You're still you're playing what should win you the long term strategy. If you can't see that, you're too dumb to play this game. Let's go talk to people that are smarter than you. It's a really difficult concept, I think, to for executives. I thought I thought Renner. We've talked about this a lot on the pod. Renner summed it up really, really well right around draft time. He said, you've got general managers who have to sell themselves to owners. And they're going to sell. Like, when I go sell myself to the Houston Texans, I'm going to be like, look, I know everything. Mm. I know I'm going to pick the best players. We're going we're gonna to draft well. We're going to get the right players in here. When a good general manager, and you see what Belichick has done and New England and other teams have done, says, well, I'm, I'm going to miss. I'm not that much better. than I, I think I am at least a little bit better, but I'm not that much better than the next closest guy. And then our edge is going to be picking more often, right? It just, it's just historically that's it. We talked about the Seahawks in this vein a couple of years ago, right? Or just last week. They had that stretch where it's like, wow, they're great drafters. They drafted Russell Wilson, Richard Sherman, Earl Thomas. They drafted Bobby Wagner, all these great players over a couple-year period. And then they started not drafting as well. So here's the problem, right? Nobody that works in personnel in the NFL has ever read Socrates. 
and that's the issue, right? Socrates said the true wisdom comes from knowing that you know nothing. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem is that none of these people have ever heard that quote, or if they do, they read it in a cereal packet. Mm. Um, and it's not that, look, I, I would say that the evidence is, is there that John Dorsey has better personnel instincts or abilities than a lot of people in the NFL, right? But it's not so much that you throw everything out in terms of strategy and say, all right, John, pick all the best players. You, we're, you do what you like. We're not doing anything. And that's how we're going to win, right? It needs to be that on top of an already sound strategy that will already generate you an edge. And then you have a guy who's slightly better at picking than other people. Now you have two edges working in your right. favor. And you've got like a 5% chance of beating everybody else across the board. You can't just go, we have a guy that's slightly better than everybody else. Therefore, all we're doing is letting him run the show. And, and, we, and then we, using Seattle in a positive light, we talked about this during the draft last year. They turned one draft pick into six. Smart. Right? And out of those six, if they get two players, well, two's more than one. Right. Right? And this was the, you know, the opposite of this was the Saints and Marcus Davenport. They traded all that they could to go get Marcus Davenport. Or even they, the Tunsil thing. Like, if you could turn the thing. all those right. picks into two players instead of one, you're better. Right. So there's, there's just a lot of risk involved with drafting fewer times. Yeah. So the people that said, well, you got to turn the draft picks into something... Yes. Yes, you do. But it's the right strategy to accumulate draft picks. Correct. You have to turn the, st the draft picks into somebody in order for it to be successful. That doesn't mean it was wrong to do it that way and, just because you didn't. And you're absolutely right, too. I think we're in a, an even richer time to go get veterans yeah. using draft capital. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of teams do that. You spend a draft. Plus, you spend, if you spend a third to go, like Seattle just spent a third to go get Jadavian Clowney. Which if they, they don't might have get back, the, which they which they're going to get right. back, right? So that's how you manipulate this. Draft capital is more the, than just being again, able to draft. Like the Patriots have done that for years. This gaming the system when it comes to um, compensatory picks. Compensatory yeah, they traded picks. a fifth rounder for Akib Talib, got a year and a half of production out of right. him, and then let him walk and got a third rounder. They've in been exchange. doing that for years. This idea of it's not even necessarily costing you those picks to get these veteran players. You're going to get them back if you let them walk out the door again. Right. So I think. All that said, the Dolphins are in great position. If people tell you, well, they, they've screwed up the last 20 years of the draft, <laughs> therefore it's, not, it's useless, well, you don't listen to those people right. because this is the way to do it. Or, and or the learning point in that is that you know, maybe that's the part you need to fix. right? If you're doing the right way and you still can't draft anybody because all the people making personnel decisions suck, fire the people making the personnel decisions because the, the strategy – to set them Strategy up for draft sound. picks was fine. Right. Right. What happened is that you just got a bunch of people throwing darts at the draft board after that and it went bad. So if you're looking for an area to fix in all that, fix that part, not the, the draft strategy, which was actually fine. So there you go. Whew. Good job, Dolphins. You're set up for the post Tom you're Brady era. You're set up to be the worst team in the NFL for two straight years. Congratulations. I'm looking, I'm looking to the future. Houston. Uh, I'll solve your issues at the end of the year. So All right. You've got bigger problems because you're not going to be that bad. You're, just, you're just making wrong but They moves. could win the AFC South this year. How hard could it be? How hard could it be? So let's move on to some notable cuts. Yes. And we'll, uh, we'll round that up. A um, guy that we liked coming out of the draft, Josh Doxson. Yeah. Looks like we missed on him. Well, that was before we were really like, listen, let's avoid the contested catch guys because he made some spectacular con contested catches in, in college. I, he did. So... Yes. So far, things are not looking good for the Josh Doxson evaluation pre-draft. Having said that, I think that he is a real candidate for one of those change of scenery bounce backs yeah. in a way that some of these other guys aren't. Um, I, I really think that he's shown enough at the NFL level to still, like injuries have been a big part of his thing. Um, I think he's got legitimately got the ability to bounce back in a way that, for example, Laquan Treadwell does not. That's fair. Um, so yeah, the things are not looking good right now for the, uh, for the Josh Doxson thing, but I, 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 I'm not ready to write them off entirely yet. I think there's still a chance. I would also say receiver is one of those positions. We talk about the NFL having plenty of QBs receiver is one of those positions where you get these former first rounders, you get these guys kind of floating around that can be valuable. They're not going to be Julio Jones or anything like that out of, out of nowhere, but I think you can stock up on some, some different style receivers in today's NFL. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, they, and they could be useful and helpful in a pass game. Yep. Um, but Josh Doxson, you talked about um, the other guy's consistency. Treadwell. Um, the Seahawks trade. 
63. The guy that had 63 every year. Oh, Martin. Yeah, Martin, sorry. 63 last year for Doxon, 62.5 in 2017. Those were his two full seasons with the Redskins. Yeah. So kind of meh. Um, LaShawn McCoy cut by the Buffalo Bills. Already signed by the, the Chiefs. Andy Reid gets him back. I mean, what does Andy Reid want with LaShawn McCoy? For a, like, guy that, a guy that can do stuff in space. For like $4 million. It's not even like it was just a veteran minimum. Right, he could be useful in this offense. Yeah, but it's like all the wheel routes and different things. Right, but have we not just passes. spent the last two years showing that Andy Reid could plug in you and get that kind of production out yeah, of the running back have, position? Yeah, but if you have guys that, that's a little bit faster. I don't know. That's, that's helpful. Just, that's, that's disappointing for the uh, Andy Reid is a guru crowd. I know. It just feels like of all the teams, right? it's scariest. Like we've had all there. this data. What's the, Ben Baldwin has all, this, has all this data about, you know, throwing to running backs is not a good idea generally. But if this one team for whom that is not true, it's the Chiefs because they're able to maximize this well. production. Yeah. By definition, suggesting that that's not the running back. It's what they've been doing. Therefore, if there's one team in the NFL that does not need to bring in LaShawn McCoy for a mo- you know, moderately decent amount of money, it's the Chiefs. Deshaun Kaiser's been cut by the Green Bay Packers with Tim Boyle taking over yes. as a backup. More importantly, meaning that Tim Boyle got that roster spot as the backup. He looks really good. Aaron Rodgers. He's good. Preseason. Legitimately, I think Tim Boyle is good. Yeah. Like, not just, you know, good against UPS drivers and he's a guy to keep an eye on. the pre- like, He's actually good. Was well, speaking to an uh, NFL QB coach hmm. who agreed. I see. That's it. QB coach. Hmm. 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 Could have been anybody. Could have been. Could have been anybody. Could have been anybody. <laughs> the uh, the likelihood of it being anybody is small. So, but uh, yeah, so Kaiser, terrible, terrible player. Deshaun uh, Kaiser. Tim Boyle, not a terrible player. Kaiser was one of those guys. Did not grade well for us in college. No. We said he was a, he was the guy again because hitting on the quarterback is so valuable. I didn't mind using a second rounder. On he him. was the classic. The tools are there. The yeah. play is not. I'm okay throwing a second at that because that's kind of where you should take those yes. players. But he was. There the were shot. some people who absolutely loved him coming out, and he made a couple really nice throws. Yeah. In the preseason, his first year, which is something he showed in college, but the consistency was just so poor. You cannot be blinded by the couple of really nice plays. He just was a tick late. Pocket presence wasn't good. Overall accuracy was not good. Maybe he's, and he he's just hasn't developed. Also, he's the poster child for that. It's not about how. It's not about can do. It's about how often. Oh, the can like do was can, there again. If you if you looked at just what he could do, he's as good as any quarterback prospect that's come along in the past few years. The problem was how often that happened, and the answer was not very. Yes. And it never got any better. In fact, if anything, it got dramatically worse. So didn't hate at all where he was drafted. That's where you take a shot on players like that, particularly when that year, I think the Browns had already drafted in the first round twice, right? They, this was like their third this pick. This was their fourth pick. Fourth pick. This is the year they got Miles Garrett, uh, Jabril Peppers, and David Njoku, right. I believe. Okay, yeah. So it was like, yeah, third, fourth pick, perfect place to take him worth a shot yes. wasn't the answer you come back you take a proper quarterback later and this is where the whole volume drafting yeah. makes a ton of sense mm-hmm. and when you draft him in the second round you're not like that's it we're rallying around Deshaun kaiser he's our man going forward you're like no he's we're just taking a stab at it right. in the second round we like his can do let's see if we can improve the how often no we couldn't sorry bye bye let's flip him for nothing yeah um so two former gators who absolutely had the worst off seasons, combines, and pro days of recent memory. Yes. Tease Tabor and Ja'Kai Polite. So Ja'Kai Polite was drafted this past year in the third round and got cut. Right. This like when was the last time a third rounder got cut? I mean, we were making the fun same of year. Willie Beavers for being a fourth fourth rounder, rounder got cut. cut. Ja'Kai Polite. But the difference between that was like the Willie Beavers thing. Like he was a terrible college player. Who you're like? What the hell did they take him in the fourth round for? He sucks. Yeah, and it took him like three weeks to, to work out. You know what? You're right. Actually, he does suck. Well, it's bye bye. He's still earning jobs. Whereas polite was getting like first round talk a few months ago. Yeah. And then he went like shows up at the combine. You know, carrying some chunk, looking out of shape, out of like out of desire. Like just didn't give a toss. Right. Yeah. Rolls in there. You're like, ooh. Didn't run well. Didn't do anything well at the combine. Right. Drops didn't him like. Prove it at the pro day. Drops him like two rounds because of like worries, character concerns, etc. And now he's gone from being a third rounder to cut. Man, I didn't mind that as a third rounder because it's like, all right, let's again, take a chance where you on take those spring. guys, right. right? He's got first round talent. He's clearly some kind of asshole who doesn't care about all this because look at what he's done. Apparently and, that matters. <laughs> apparently quite a lot. A lot. So that means the Jets haven't gotten anything. They got Quinn and Williams had no second rounder. Right. 
and then just cut their third rounder. The other interesting thing is they like change the whole staff, right? Because they fire their GM after the draft. So that probably didn't help in terms of his his chances of sticking on the roster. The the guy that Cleveland Farrell, right? The guy that made that call got booted out of the door the second the draft was finished. Yeah, I felt like they probably didn't want him around in general. Yeah. Tease Tabor was the fascinating case of the guy who's pro day. He ran a bad 40 at the Combine, and then somehow it got worse. We got, hmm, that wasn't even English. No, no Somehow it, it got worse at pro day. Yeah. I don't know what's up with the Gators and be, their inability to. Uh, final time? Train. Did he end up running slower than Renner? It was like 4.8 something, I right. think. Right. Or like high 4.7s. Renner like can't start a 40, and he almost ran faster than Tease Tabor. It was Renner range. And Tabor, at one point, did look like a first round. He was a second rounder, but he looked like a first round caliber corner with good instincts, off coverage, yeah. all these different things. Never really came together with the Detroit Lions. So, but yes, maybe the cautionary tale that Polite uh, and Tabor, it, it might not just be the fact that they're less athletic than their NFL peers, just the fact that at a time – when they're supposed to have their but the job thing, interview right, and yes, be really, really good the at key. this, they Cause, struggle. Because the thing is, Polite does, isn't less athletic than everybody else. It's just that once he's... That's, he, he Ryan leafed it, right? The season finished, and instead of being in the film room and the weight room and the, the whatever pre-combine training camps they all do, he, like, sat in a hot tub and ate Cheetos. Like, that's the difference. He's not... I mean, you put on the tape... The boss was up in his office, like waxing lyrical about this guy burst off the edge, his band. Like, he looks like a first round player when you put on the tape. Right. But apparently, just mailed it in from that point on and was carrying, you know, carrying a gut. Not great. That's not going to work. Noah Spence got cut by the Tampa Bay Bucks. He was another guy. He went in the second round in 2016. Another guy that had first round hype at one point, a little undersized, former Ohio State Buckeye turned. Eastern Connecticut, um, Kentucky. Eastern Kentucky Colonel. Yeah. I'm reading it, and I said the wrong. Good work. But he's kind of declined over the last couple of years. 40 pressures in 2016, banged up the last two years, only 13 pressures in 2017 and 18. I just love that progression. 40, then 12, then 1. Yeah, not no, great. Okay, snaps of, you know, well, snaps similarly declined. 569, 246, 45. The, I mean, there was another one of those guys where the writing is on the wall when you can't dominate preseason. Yeah. And if anything, his preseason grades have also gone down. Now, is he got more pressures this season, but that's because he rushed the passer twice the amount of time that he normally does. Showcase still him a sucked. Bit. So, yeah. yeah. We Spence. thought he had designated pass rush type of ability, has never really come together. I'm sure he'll find a spot. Yeah. But, um, and then Demarius Thomas with the New England Patriots. There was a point, I mean, so he had a really nice week, a preseason week four, which essentially was against AAF corners. Yes. Not even. Was, like AAF corners have long since secured their roster spot and aren't being trotted out for that game. That's a good point. Um, Demary, there was a point where I think people were looking at the Patriots wide receiver depth chart and saying, okay, there's a spot to have Josh Gordon and Demarius Thomas and Edelman and Dorsett and Nikhil Hag have all these guys. Yeah. But yeah, um, being on the outside. he's still working his way back the, from I mean, injury and week, everything. Preseason week four, which this is like the first time we've mentioned it in this podcast, which I think shows in and of itself how inconsequential it is. But, like, nobody playing in week four has any business being on an NFL roster, essentially. You, like, the starters for week four are guys you've never heard of. Oh, except, bizarrely, I want to know what team rule Julian Edelman broke that he was still being trotted out there with these UPS drivers. Oh, because he hadn't played yet. They wanted him yeah. to get some action. So? And most of the starters in the NFL haven't played in the preseason yeah, so him far. and Josh Gordon both got reps because they hadn't played football. But Josh Gordon at least has broken many team re- rules over the, uh, the previous few years. Edelman did have... Banged up. I'm just saying, thumb. Edelman, like, he must have been sitting there going, what am I doing out here with these wasters? I think he wanted to get some reps because he was on the NFI for the a while. The other guy, can I? Can, can we mention, is, uh, uh, what's that guy's name? Kyle Vedvik, the guy the Vikings traded a fifth-round pick for like a week and a half ago. Yeah, you pronounce his name. I'm not him. doing it. I think it's, was it, is, what is his first name? Vedvik is his second name. Is his first name Kyle? I don't think so. Kivari? Yeah. Something. Begins with K. That, I mean, look, we, he got cut, so we don't need to figure out what his first name is. I think everything you pronounced is wrong. What? No, Vedvik is right. All right, go ahead. I'm just saying, we don't need to learn what his first name is because he couldn't stick on the roster. But the point is, the Vikings went from <laughs> trading fifth-round pick like a week ago to cutting this guy. He was like, he can kick and punt. He'll be the answer to all of our special teams problems. And it turns out he can't do either of those, at least not in Minnesota, which is starting to look like it might be the bigger problem than the guys they bring in to actually do the kicking and the punting. Like at this point, 
Vedvix had like what six, 17 out of 18 kicks or something with the Ravens across his preseasons. Goes to the Vikings, gets like one out of four. Daniel Carlson was so bad they get rid of him, and he's now he's so good at Auburn. Though. He's but he's only missed like one kick for the Raiders right. now. Um, yeah, you can't predict kickers. You bring in Dan Bailey, who's like the most accurate kicker in NFL history. I don't know if he still is because he's been playing with the Vikings for a year or so. They, uh, it's this is like a legitimate whatever about Chicago's kicking situation, which is a bit of a joke. Like the Vikings might be worse. The N- Packers are just going to win the North because because they have a kicker. Bears and Vikings can't kick. I would say there are better uses for fifth round picks. Well, then setting fire to one. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. We've seen other Kari teams. Kari Vedvik. Kari. K double A R E, which I'm going to say is I pronounced Kari. I mean, it's probably pronounced Kyle in Gaelic or whatever you speak. He's Norwegian. It's not. I know, but it probably is. I don't like think that, it is. Those letters put together probably actually say Sam or something like that <laughs> in Gaelic, which doesn't make any sense. Um, there are fifth rounders flipped for potential starting offensive linemen around yeah. the NFL, and we've had a whole video on that. How val- Think about how difficult it is to find a starting offensive lineman, and you can use a fifth round pick to find a guy that's But proven. the other thing is, like, if you, you know, if you... Like, it's like, I think trading a fifth round pick for an answer to a perennial problem at kicker is not necessarily a, a terrible plan. You solve it. Yes. The, the Vikings problem is that they've now done that a few times and can't find the guy to fix it. Yeah. Like, it's like, oh, we're going to trade a fifth round pick for Justin Tucker and we're, we're good. We don't have to worry about it for the next 15 years. And then Justin Tucker comes in, like breaks a hip looks like uh, Roberto Aguayo and we have to do it all over again and we look like idiots. That's what's happening essentially to the Vikings. They keep throwing at these like can't miss kicker solutions and miss repeatedly. Good luck with your kicker situation. Sam, that was a good podcast. We talked about a lot of stuff. We probably forgot some things too, but we had to hit on a lot. Oh, can I, can we, would you, would you, one last thing yeah. because we ranted about it before the podcast and we can't let that go with it. Why are teams still trading for Carlos Hyde as the solution to their running back problems? Well, because when you trade Martinez Rankin, sure, who's going to get you? Didn't cut? give up much, but my point is more like you could this. There's a fifteen hundred people just got cut, right? I don't know what percentage of them are running backs, but I'm betting at least half of them are as good as Carlos Hyde. They're not as big though. They're not. People but still think he could be a big goal line guy. Even if, you just, even if you just limited yourself to the sample sizes of teams that have recently traded for Carlos Hyde, you would come to the conclusion that this is not the best way of solving the problem. Yeah. Why are teams still doing it? I don't know, man. Stop doing it. It's a bad idea. Because you don't want him to go on the open market and have to compete <laughs> with other people for Carlos Hyde. So you take Martinez Rankin, who's already been, it was, it was one of those classic, he's already been reported as released. And then it was like, oh, by the way, they found Yeah, actually, somebody was prepared to flip their least consequential uh, piece of value instead for Carlos Hyde. So Carlos he, where'd Hyde. Where'd he go? He's gone to Houston? To Houston. I would be staggered if they didn't already have at least two running backs better than Carlos Hyde. By the way, Martinez. This is Rankin. after like uh, Lamar Miller goes down. Ranking another third round pick. Well, if he just gets his stuff together, they're like, there. So here's the interesting thing about draft analysis with like a Jakai Polite or even a Rankin and all that stuff. We're we're always playing the odds. So it's like I don't mind you putting these resources toward this pick in the middle rounds because there's this small chance that he pans out, and if but if he does pan out. The payoff is so great, right? It's just like getting really good odds on a bet or bad odds on a bet, but a high payout, right? Yeah. So a lot of them don't end up panning out. And then you look back and it's like, okay, that draft got you nothing or whatever it is. But at the time, the process is sound. At the time, the Texans were desperate for O-line help, still are. Mm -hmm. And they had to throw third rounders at tackles. Can I also just say that the worst, the worst, the guys that I feel the most sorry for in this whole process are the ones that make the initial roster after cut day and then get booted because somebody else got cut that the team wants. Oh, yeah. So like the the guys that, you know, they, they, those guys must spend that entire Saturday or even Friday now because it starts getting early. But that those entire two days basically sitting there with that feeling of dread in the pit of your stomach waiting for the Turk to knock on the door and say, the the coach wants to see you can you bring your playbook and spend the like 48 hours essentially at this point with that feeling and then i made it i I, I didn't get cut i made the roster 
And then like four hours later, it's like actually the coach wants to bring in Laquan Treadwell and you're the you're Laquan Treadwell and you're the first guy out. So Yeah, the fifty third man on the roster. It's a right. spot to be. That's gotta suck. The I end. can relate. Yeah? Except How? at the minor league level. <laughs> it's another dollar. Cut three times, Sam. Yeah. Three times. Like by the same people or No, no. No. Three you weren't times. like the you weren't uh, you they didn't the, bring me back. You weren't the equivalent Brewers. of the Ventrones? No. They did not bring me back. Oh. Okay. Brewers, then the Giants, then the Mariners. Hmm. First two, didn't see it coming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, is that better or worse? Oh, it's worse. Yeah? Because, like, like the, the anticipation of sitting there for, like, all day waiting for the guy to knock on the door and then he does, that's got to be bad. No. They, no, so in spring training, they just, they just wander around and they're just, like, just pick you up, uh-huh. you know? So with the Brewers, I was like, man, I'm going to go figure out where am I going this year? Am I going to high A? Am I going to low A? Where am I going? And they're like, uh, yeah, they need to see you. Huh. Reed needs to see you. Reed Nichols yeah. cut me. And then with the Giants, sensed it coming. Yeah. I think I told everybody. I, I kind of like disappeared off the, uh, the next couple day pitching list in spring training. Mm. Usually pitch every other day as a reliever. All of a sudden it's like, hey, I'm not pitching for the next three days. Yeah. Mm. This is curious. Cut. <laughs> and then with the Mariners, I knew this was happening. I'm in double A. I, I ESPN bottom line, it's like Mariners trade one guy for like seven double A pitchers. So I was like, well, I'm the odd man out. It. So they call me in the office. I'm like, I know. I got it. Been here before. I'm out. I already packed, my bag don't worry yeah, about it. I was ready. Plus, I was pitching horribly. Like, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Kelly was in town. Every time she came in town, I got demoted or cut yeah. or something. So Just warm up relate. the car, honey. We're, we're, <laughs> we're heading back together. I can relate. Okay. It's really important to make all this news about you. Right? Oh, absolutely. Like Andrew Luck. Retiring at 29. Mm-hmm. I mean, I retired at 30. I can relate. Yeah. I understand mm-hmm. a lot of what Andrew Luck's going through. Very similar. Very similar. Very similar situation. Mm-hmm. But I was healthier than him. You didn't get booed off the field. No. No. Our PR team kept it under wraps. Got you out of the building when before that happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the difference between me and Andrew Luck is I, uh, I was a part of two championship parades. Huh. In my career. Okay. And he did not have, and they were celebrating uh, division titles over in, in, it was like AFC championship participant in Indianapolis. That's what y- they said. You're celebrate. also hobbling around better than he is right now. I am. All right. My knee's getting better. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. From not playing yeah. basketball. Your rehab's complete. All right. We've lost everybody. Yeah. It's, it's true. This is our podcast. Early week. We'll be back on Thursday. Yeah. Preview in week one. I can't believe it. We're Actual football. Here. Real football is here. Week one. Everybody enjoy it. Be sure to get to PFF.com. Get your PFF Elite Package because it's what you need to dominate the season no matter what you're doing. All right, guys. See you Thursday. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.